Here. Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Schron? Mr. Schron is absent at the moment. Ms. Conwell? Yes. Mr. Jones? Here. Mr. Hairston? Here. Ms. Conley? Here. There is a quorum. We usually have a um, moment of silence on our agenda for our regular meetings, but I'd like to take a moment of silence today um, for the father of our sheriff, Frank Bova. It's Frank Bonia Bova Sr. Um, passed away um, several days ago. His funeral was today. He'd been a dedicated public servant and law enforcement officer in this community for many years, and we'd like to recognize his passing by a moment of silence. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Moving on to item three, is there any public comment related to the agenda? Yes, Madam Chair, there is. Uh, the first speaker is Mary Ann Barnes. Ms. Barnes, if you'd come up, you have three minutes. Okay. Right yes, right here. You can sit or if you'd like to stand. Okay. Sorry, okay, thank you. you can hear me now. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, Madam President, uh, members of County Council, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald, and uh, members of the press and the public. Uh, uh, my name is Mary Ann Barnes, and I am uh, co-president of the League of Women Voters of Cuyahoga area. And I am speaking today for the members of all three leagues of women voters in Cuyahoga County. And we would like to address you this evening on the proposed county ordinance, taking a stand against the current against current and any future state-sponsored erosion of voter rights in Cuyahoga County. Uh, League members support this voting rights ordinance because we have not forgotten the problems that Ohio voters experienced in 2004. Ohio's adoption of no-fault absentee and early in-person voting after that dysfunctional election has prevented a repeat of similar problems particularly in urban areas where population is high and residents move frequently. Since that time, our County Board of Elections has taken initiatives to make our county decisions both more efficient and more user-friendly as well, for which uh, both the League of Women Voters and I'm sure great many voters are grateful. Um, why change a program that works so well? Counties save money when up to a third of Ohio voters cast ballots before Election Day. Any increased costs associated with early voting can be made up with efficiencies facilitated by early voting, such as consolidating precincts, reducing polling places and poll workers and voting machines, for example. While other states are looking to expand early voting options, Ohio is moving in the opposite direction. In the name of uniform procedures, among Ohio's 88 counties, we now hear that a one-size-fits-all process should treat densely populated urban counties the same as sparsely populated rural counties. The establishment of uniform procedures across the state fails to consider unique needs and instead aims for the lowest common denominator. For these reasons, we urge you to exercise the residual powers inherent in our new form of charter county government and adopt this voting rights ordinance for Cuyahoga County. And thank you for giving us this opportunity to address you this evening, or this afternoon, rather. Thank you. Thank you. Another speaker? Adele Eisner. Ms. Eisner, oh, okay. My name is Adele Eisner, and I thank you for the opportunity uh, for speaking with you. Uh, County Council, Madam Chairman, Executive, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald. Um, I unfortunately do not have an eloquent statement to make other than the eloquence of saying a huge thank you for considering this resolution. After reading it, I think it really does explain the problems it explains solutions. It takes courage to put forth. Uh, my own history is that for the past 15 years, I have been working my bones down 
for voter rights and to see what has happened in Ohio underlaid with excuses that make no sense and often with virulent hateful um, with virulent hateful underlays of philosophies um, it's not only sad I think it's horrific so once again I'm hoping that this committee of the whole will um, hastily put forth this item onto the county council's agenda and hastily pass it. Uh, and again, I wanna thank you for your courage, your leadership, your leadership, and I came here in appreciation. So thank you very much. Thank you, and just for your, um, everybody's edification, this is in the committee of the whole and it will be referred to, assuming we have the votes that assume will be passed on to the regular agenda for our next meeting, which is next Tuesday. Anyone else sign in? No, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, item three, items referred to committee. And Madam Clerk, will you read the first item? Resolution number 2014-0082, a resolution confirming the county executive's appointment of Elise Hera upon her taking the oath of office as Cuyahoga County Director of Human Resources and declaring the necessity that this resolution become immediately effective. Uh, Ms. Hara is here for confirmation, and it has been our practice to allow you to make essentially an opening statement, and then we'll entertain questions from uh, any members of the um, council. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with all of you for the past almost three and a half years, and I want to thank you and the executive for giving uh, my department their necessary resources, I think, to succeed in the task that I was assigned. Um, I know you have a very lengthy agenda, so I will be brief. Uh, as reflected in my resume, I've spent a majority of my career as a public servant. My last position was with a nonprofit as their general counsel. I have always been passionate about my work. As a public defender in Philadelphia, I always felt that those who could afford the least should be provided with the best. I feel that is equally true for government. The taxpayers deserve to be served by competent individuals, and that is something that I have held true in my career for the last 20 plus years. In 2011, I was tasked with ensuring the professional delivery of HR services. Under my watch, the county now has a consolidated HR department. Much has been centralized and streamlined since 2011 in anticipation of the move to a new building, another consolidation, and future enterprise resource system. I'm going to just highlight um, some of the work that was done in the last three years. It is not an all exhaustive list, but it'll give you a flavor of what we did. In 2011, we did civil servant classification, and as you know, we had to merge uh, almost 2,000 people within an existing government for a total of 4,700 employees. We did ethics training um, live for all employees in 2011, which was quite a daunting task. We participated in health benefit selection processes and issued recommendations having been vetted before you. We did mandatory supervisory training, which was completed in September of 2011, four sessions for the first time um, in quite some time. There was consistent discipline uh, training and supervisory training. The Archer study was completed October 17th, 2011. Um, the selection of Vitality for 2012 with a wellness program, those of you who know me know that I'm a bit of a health uh, nut and a fitness nut, so this was close to me and the executive. We got it going and the enrollment continues to be a success as we progress. 2012, some quick highlights. The HR department reorganize, reorganization was completed January 30th. The HR training program for staff was created and we implemented a three-day orientation for HR staff. As you know, I inherited some individuals, but I also had a substantial um, ability to hire new employees in HR and those folks needed to be trained so that they understood what it was like to work in a civil servant setting with 36 unions. Regionalism, at the behest of the executive, we did training and consulting services. We drafted a consulting agreement with the help of the law department. We did a training brochure with the help of the IT department, and we've been marketing those programs successfully um, to the region. 
We regionalized and continue to regionalize health benefits, and I can give you a list of all the folks who are on board to date, if you so wish. Um, as a result of the work that had been done by me and the staff, I was the recipient of the 2012 HR Executive of the Year Archer Award, um, which was an honor that was accepted um, on my behalf by the executive, and it was a pretty exhaustive list of the accomplishments that I think this government, um, with your approval, uh, were successful. We did online ethics training for 2012 because I did find it quite daunting to have all the employees have to come out of their operations, and we continue to build on that training program and making sure that as much uh, training as can be done online successfully will continue to be built on. We attended job fairs for the first time in a very long time in a very methodical manner, trying to select the job fairs in the region that make sense, that would attract the folks that would be interested in working for the county, uh, and that was done by the recruitment uh, team. We started in 2012 doing HR retreats. Not only do I meet regularly with all 66 staff members, some of which are here today, um, but we also do an annual retreat where we talk about what we can build on, where we need our skills, and I try to assist them with my legal background. 2013 HR orientation video was completed with the executive, so now every month we do an orientation for every employee, sometimes every two weeks. Again, it's streamlined with a video. It gives a very nice panorama of all the services that are provided by this county. Um, we introduced calibration training successfully, which I have to say um, was a very pleasant surprise to me. I thought calibration would be a concept that most people would find time consuming, but I got very positive feedback from all the directors and the managers. What that means is now, when your evaluations are done countywide, the scores are calibrated so that the scores in public works will mirror the scores in HR or in other departments. That is also a very important process that needs to continue to be built on. We've had three years now of standardized employee evaluations, which is a critical component if you're going to work with merit and fitness and pay equity. You have to have objective data to rely on employee performances. We've done that. Um, and that was a great effort done uh, by the analysts and the specialists in my department. We participated in the creation of the HR specs for the ERP RFP, sorry for all the acronyms, um, but that was a very daunting um, labor intensive process because I needed all my team leaders to weigh in on benefits, time in attendance, discipline, uh, hiring process so that when we work with IT and fiscal to vet that vendor process, we're getting the best, more, most efficient processes in place as we roll that out. Uh, and finally, something that I'm actually very, very proud of with the, the training um, management group in HR is as we worked to support the sheriff with Metro to get the Metro staff to be successful in the jail, we had a very important role in terms of making sure that we heard the needs of Metro. And what that meant is a lot of their staff didn't know what it was like to deliver services in a jail setting. So as of last week, again, with the incredible support of the IT department, um, we now have an orientation video that has been presented to Dr. Tallman so that every time new medical jail comes in, that staff gets oriented and they get a sense for an hour and a half of all the information of what it's like to deliver services in that setting. We did it in a video so that they can break it up and do the orientation again without disrupting their operations. None of this could have been successfully accomplished without a strong team and the collaboration of my fellow directors, in particular Jeff Mowry and Majid McClouf. Um, his department, the law director, transitioned the labor work and negotiated those 36 contracts brilliantly with HR understanding that we were a support role, we were not supposed to be the front and lead negotiators at the table. That's actually, I think, been a win-win for the county, for the unions, and for both of our departments. 
I inherited some incredibly capable staff and I hired new employees with the right HR educations and backgrounds. We still have a lot to accomplish, but the blueprint of a solid HR department that can serve as a business partner to all county agencies is well established to ensure transparent HR and employment practices for future administrations. That's the task that I was given and I believe it's been accomplished in this time frame. Thank you, Ms. Hera. I think I should have called on Ms. Conwell first. I believe that you had comments to make or? Oh, okay. All right, so go ahead and start with your questions. To the chair, to the director, you just, uh, your last line, Director Harry, you accomplished a lot in your three years with over half a year left in this year. Uh, what plans or directions do you have for the next four year term? The next four year term? Or in moving forward? I think the next six months, um, we have to finish up the evaluations, make sure that that ERP process is in place. Jeff Mowry and I will be working very closely to ensure, we'll continue to work very closely to ensure that the right vendor is selected and that our staff is well trained to be able to effectuate that. I have an imminent move in July, and although you don't hear about us a lot, HR is pretty instrumental in ensuring that the employees are transitioned smoothly into their new building, and I think there's going to be a lot of goodwill and excitement about that prospect. Uh, the next four years, I suppose um, I will be um, available if the next administration is so inclined. All right, uh, next question. If you had to prioritize the following, and the reason that I asked the four years is because there's a lot of things that HR still has to uh, prioritize and move forward with. If you had to prioritize the following, civil service testing, pay equity, or completion of the classifications, in what order would you prioritize and why? That's a very good question. Um, Councilwoman Conwell, I think the, um, the first priority is to ensure that the PRC gets the civil servant testing in place. Why? We've never had a centralized testing. When I first came on board, I recognized that uh, all of our population is civil servants. We have a few unclassifieds, but I won't, they're not really the focus of the next step for the, for the, uh, for the next administration. What has to happen is, there has to be a setup for testing, and I have stressed to the PRC that there has to be a nexus between the job description and the tests that are created. This is not something that should be done uh, by an HR department. It's something that should be separate for autonomy's sake, um, for transparency's sake, and I think the way it works and the way I've um, spoken to their administrator is they do the testing, they do that part of the scoring, they give HR the lists, we then work with the directors to ensure that the positions are filled with the proper interviewing processes. I think that has got to be um, front and center. Now that doesn't have a lot to do with my department in terms of setting that structure up, but I think that's very critical. Pay equity, I think that's also very important, but. Everybody wants to reach pay equity very quickly, and unfortunately, when you have a new government, that's just not um, attainable. It, you, you don't get a set of evaluations after one year and say, okay, we have the evaluations, let's fix all the salaries. We actually did some pay equity work when we um, restructured layoffs, and we did um, pay reductions, and in some cases, pay increases. Uh, that was the first step. The second step in my mind professionally was to get an ability to quantify people's work. And that was done through three years of consistent evaluations and improving and building on that evaluation process. So the next step will be to hear what the PRC's recommendation is with respect to movement along steps they may say that they don't think that the um, salary schedule is um, a, a good tool. They may say, you know, we have a different means of awarding salaries and, and moving people along a different type of scale. They're doing that. 
uh, by getting their vendor and, and vetting that process. Their recommendations, I would imagine, will come to the director of HR, who will then present it to the executive and determine what should be proposed to council. And so, you know, and my main question was to prioritize. So you would put civil uh, pay servant. equity, uh, civil service first, but pay equity over <coughs> the completion of the classifications? What do you mean by completion of classifications? Um, I know that there's the IT, there's a few. No, other. those will be completed okay. um, so within the next couple two. months. That's, that's, I wouldn't even consider that as part of my priority list. It's, it's finished. We're wrapping a few things up, but that's been completed in my mind, uh, certainly within the next um, six months, but before then. I think the next big projects are civil servant testing centralized and administered in an efficient manner um, that's not too heavy with bureaucracy. And then once that is done, the pay equity component, and I'm only prioritizing it that way because I'm aware of the vendor selection and the steps that the PRC are taking, so I'm just being realistic about the timeline. Okay, because my focus is they can both move along together, pending on the RFP. Uh, third question and final question for this round, if you had to uh, choose from what you have accomplished thus far, which has been a lot, with Human Resource Department, what do you think is your best accomplishment? Selecting the uh, employees that I have in this department. All right, Mr. Miller. Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Hara, congratulations on your uh, recommendation for appointment. And uh, my first question, uh, kind of a, a state of the county type question, uh, wh where do you think we're currently at in terms of employee morale and what do you think could be done for it to be improved? Councilman Miller, the executive and I have discussed this and I think um, it, it may seem trite, but it's actually not. One of the biggest morale boosts is to have new surroundings. And in about two, three months, a majority of the employees at the county will have brand new offices. I've lived through transitions. When I worked at RTA, I think before I took the job, they were in the old state building, and I remember thinking, I had just come from the city of Cleveland where our offices weren't the best, and I thought it would be really nice if I had a nice office. So they gave me a tour of the RTA building in the warehouse district, and I, I was sold. I was like, oh, this is beautiful, I'm moving in here. So I do know that that will have an impact on morale, it always does. For any of you who have moved your staff into new buildings or renovated, it helps. And I don't have to tell you that coming from the administrative building and all the other four corners of the county that we've been in currently, that this will actually have a huge boost. If you ask me if salaries is a big issue, I'll tell you that empirically in the HR world, a salary increase boosts morale for about 17 days, <laughs> and, then it, it, and then it just tapers off. People take salaries um, for granted. The, the, one of the big things that I'm able to entice people when they, and I'm just talking about the folks who I interview, um, benefits is definitely a plus, especially in today's world and the changes with Obamacare, uh, there's no doubt that that is a big perk that does not exist or exists less and less in the private sector. Our salaries are not as competitive as some of the um, salaries in the private sector, especially in the HR world. My salaries and the salary structure that I have just can't get those folks on board to even apply. But when they know about the benefits, that's a big perk. The fact that we have um, a, a family-friendly environment um, we're talking about hours that are 8.30 to 4.30. They allow people to, who have daycare issues, drop off their kids, go pick them up. That's really big in today's society. We can't work from home. If I had one wish is to actually try to move the government into that direction, coming off of the administration that we did, we really couldn't um, afford 
that type of flexibility with the vigilance because we had issues, but the feds do it, and I do think that there's a way for local governments to do it as well, and um, that's priceless. Having been a working mom with a lot of flexibility in many of my jobs, including RTA, um, that to me is priceless to be able to spend time with your kids. So those are things that future administrations could certainly focus on. Uh, and I think that helps employee morale. Money's one small factor in my experience. It's the job atmosphere. Training's been huge. Um, when people don't get along, I think there was a tendency, because there was no in-house training, to just move the problem somewhere else. That's not what we do. When the directors call me or their managers call and they say, we have what I call seventh grade behavior in the sandbox, mm -hmm. we address it immediately. We go in, we force these folks to communicate and respect each other. I don't fix all problems, but it helps when you get people to talk to each other. So the work environment, I always tell the employees when I address them, you're here eight hours a day. You spend more time here than with your families. You want to enjoy your life at work. And most of them get it, but you'll always have a small percentage of naysayers. Director, uh, in terms of developing the pay equity program, uh, what do you think are the respective roles of the Human Resources Department and the uh, and the Personnel Review Commission, and, uh, and how do those two interact and, and cooperate in this process? Well, first of all, Councilman Miller, I think it does require a certain level of expertise, which is why the PRC has gone out to seek consultants to help with that process. It would be very interesting to see what other county agencies do in other states. And so I think as we collect that data and we get a chance to review it, uh, that will be helpful. I can't pretend that this is one particular area of expertise of mine, it's not, um, nor is it the expertise of the staff of the PRC. So I think they were wise to try to get advice from consultants. Right now, the only thing that we have to work with, um, and, uh, and they're based in part on the code, you can either give employees, based on merit, a lump sum to say thank you uh, for your work, and that is permissible, and the executive um, has chosen to do that last year, and I think it was well received. Um, we certainly didn't get any complaints about that. You could also move folks along steps um, if you use the right formula, but I think to do so at this point is premature with not getting more data um, and more ideas. Uh, I, I just think right now, even in my discussions with the PRC, we're limited in the formulas that we want to use, and you have a class plan and a class schedule before you that you have approved. But I can't say that that's the best way um, to address the merit and fitness that is set forth in the charter, but I don't have any other great innovative ideas at this point because I don't have any empirical data of what else has worked successfully. And so I think that once the PRC um, gets that data and information and makes proposals, they will be collaborating with the HR department to determine what makes sense vis-a-vis -vis the charter. And then we take it to you and the executive. Thanks. All right, does anyone else have questions? Ms. Simon, do you have a question? Okay. I just want to thank um, Director Harrod for the work, hard work she's put in the past three years to accomplish a monumental task of coming into a new government and facing the issues that we all faced. And I think you've done a great job and really appreciate the work um, you've done. Thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions or comments, um, I'll entertain a motion to move this matter to the regular agenda uh, for adoption under suspension of the rules. Second. Moved by Mr. Um, Brady and seconded by Mr. Germani. Any other questions or comments? M Madam President. Yes. If I could just briefly say, just say a word uh, on behalf of my director, if I could. 
Yes, proceed. Um, and just briefly, I just wanted to say, um, and uh, you can probably tell through your interactions with at least through the years and through her testimony here, but I just want to say from the perspective, not just of myself, from, from the, but from the other directors, this is an extraordinary talent that we have working for the county. She's been an extraordinary team member, and I've known her for 20 years, but I can tell you her, her personal values have been reflected in the quality of the work that she's done. I mean, I know her as somebody that's uh, as a wife and a working mother and as a daughter of immigrants that has done incredible things with her life, but she's also somebody uh, who really understands the team concept. Just objectively, besides my own personal opinion, it's an objective fact that her efforts have led to the savings of literally millions of dollars for the taxpayers of this county. And I would just say two things um, in terms of even folks outside the county that have, rep that have recognized her excellence. Number one, the fact, as she mentioned uh, briefly, she's been recognized by her peers in 2012 as being the premier public sector HR professional in this county. That was something that was done through peer review. Not just my opinion, peer review. Secondly, um, the fact that we have continued to be able to expand our health care services uh, to other uh, municipalities is because um, she has established a working relationship with suburbs in Cuyahoga County, and they have confidence in the caliber of the work that both Elise and her staff have done. I don't think I have a single director that understands the team concept as well. So when you see the successes of the IT department or the sheriff's department or any other number of departments, it's in large part because of the work that she's done. I think you've probably seen that in the last three years, but I just I would be remiss if I didn't uh, relate that to you from my perspective as well. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, um, it's been moved and seconded that this matter be moved to the uh, regular agenda under suspension of the rules for adoption at our next meeting, which is Tuesday, April 15th? 8th, sorry, April 8th. All to the favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Congratulations, Ms. Harrell. You moved on to the next step. All right, moving on to item B. Ms. Madam Clerk, will you read the item, please? Resolution number 2014-0100, a resolution extending the term of Interim County Treasurer Jeanette Wright for up to an additional 90 okay. days okay. or until July 18, 2014, and declaring the necessity that this resolution become immediately effective. Um, I'd like to call on the law director to just give us a little procedural background on the um, uh, act or the interim, the status of an interim director. Sure, uh, thank you very much, Madam President. And uh, basically, under general law, there's the concept of acting directors who can serve until the new uh, successor comes in place. Uh, what uh, happened in the last uh, charter amendment is the charter introduced the idea of an interim director who can serve up to 120 days, and then um, the, they can only continue in that position either temporarily or in a longer time period if confirmed, if that continuation or that extension is confirmed by the county council. Uh, Ms. Uh, Wright has served uh, or serving th through the first four months since the adoption of that charter amendment. Uh, and the idea, because they wanted to extend her duration for another 90 days, on the recommendation of the law department, this is submitted to the council to, uh, for the confirmation of the extension. But this is not a permanent appointment, this is an extension of the interim position up to a period of an additional 90 days from, uh, from the expiration of the time period, uh, which is four months from when the Charter Amendment was adopted. Right, so this will take us through July the 18th. That's correct. And so hopefully that we'll get a recommendation for a regular appointment in a timely fashion so we won't have to rush this on the agenda like we yeah, did I, this I can't, I, Mr. Boyle is the person on, that, on, the, on the appointments, but the legalities, that's what's happened. Okay. I was kind of hoping uh, Executive Fitzgerald would be in the hot seat on that one. No, I, I, I uh, Council President, your, your, your comments are of course correct. Um, and, and just on, on that issue, there, every job in the county and every board and commission appointment is, is publicly posted, including chief of staff, every you know, executive Harris position, every other position, including the treasurer's position. And so um, they're, 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 the executive uh, administration is, is receiving resumes, applications, et cetera, and reviewing them. Uh, and, and, and obviously the expectation is that 
uh, in, in very short order, someone will be placed before this body for review and hopeful confirmation in this position. It, it's right, that. because we had to put this on the agenda because we, we have a very crowded agenda. We had to add this because of, in the interest of time, so that we would not be without a, a acting treasurer. So I, 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 on a certain level, take a mea culpa on that one as well. Okay. Um, is Ms. Wright here, and do we anticipate hearing from her, or are we just going to do this as a... Ms. Wright, yeah. can I come forward, please? Yeah. And I, I think the procedure will be that she'll give us a brief statement, and then we can determine whether or not we want to move it on to um, the regular agenda for adoption for the extension to July 18th. Okay. Good afternoon. The other lady got to sit. I don't know why they took your chair away. <laughs> <laughs> they were sure that I was going to speak, but I won't be before you long. I would just like to say uh, thank you for this opportunity to consider me for extending this position for up to 90 days. Uh, prior to joining the treasurer's office, I had been an employee with Cuyahoga County for nearly 14 years um, in various supervisory and fiscal positions. I earned my Bachelor of Science degree from The Ohio State University, where I majored in finance. I am a longtime resident of Cuyahoga County, as well as an active member of my community. Since my interim appointment to a county treasurer, I've played an active role in the creation of the contract for our last tax lien sale. My contributions included the requirement of monthly reports from the purchaser, developing and staffing an office within Cuyahoga County. Currently, they have about three veterans in that office, and setting bond requirements for properties that become vacant under the ownership of the purchaser. I have identified and improved office procedures and processes. In October 2013, the investment policy was updated. Treasury staff have compiled written office procedures and policies to prevent the loss of information and institutional knowledge uh, that is lost when we experience staffing changes. Our, standards, our office has the standards of performance that were developed and implemented for our staff. The entire Treasury staff is required to take customer service training offered through human resources. Uh, the entire Treasury staff will possess a knowledge of intermediate or better skill level in Microsoft Excel before the end of the year. Under my term as treasury, as treasurer, excuse me, uh, the treasury has also completed a successful first half real estate tax billing. We are continuing to expand our options for customer payment, including a kiosk that will be in place for the second half tax billing. Strategies are being implemented to reduce the total parcel delin uh, delinquency to six and a half percent or lower by the end of the year. The Treasury has an investment manager that continues to make prudent investments that safeguards the principal, maintains liquidity, and maximizes the yield on our investment. In addition to the work that I have done in the office, I serve as the chairperson for the Investment Advisory Committee. I'm a board member on the Cuyahoga County Land Re Utilization Corporation Board. I serve as an alternate to the fiscal officer for the purchasing, excuse me, contract and purchasing board as well as the board of control meetings. I am awaiting final approval to become a board member of the Cuyahoga County Community Improvement Corporation Board. I'm also a member of the Ohio Treasurers Association and are to participate in continual education courses offered by CPM. I thank you for your consideration and will be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I, I just have one question yes. is we continue to have uh, numerous phone calls every time the tax bills mm. are um, due uh, for people waiting in long lines and particularly this year people were waiting outside and there were changes in the location and people didn't know where to go. Now is that within your purview or do we pass that on to Mr. Parks? That is an entire county uh, that we are all responsible for that. What happened is the particular location that we're currently in does have some capacity challenges. And so what we tried to do is we tried to bring those people in. However, we did have staff standing outside that would take checks. We had a drop box that would take checks. We had a drop box right inside our office. We had uh, staff in our front office that was willing to take checks. I, as well as staff in my immediate office, was willing to take checks. We did try to uh, ask people to go online to make payments. There are some people who pay by cash that needed to stand in line. There are some people who refuse to leave the payment without an actual receipt. One of the things in which we'll have in place this year, as I stated, or this tax billing is a kiosk, as well as the fact that we're going to have another location in which we can take credit card payments to help to speed up that process. Okay. All right. Thank you. Questions? Mr. Greenspan? Not a question directly to the, to the um, acting treasurer or interim treasurer, but more to the process, you know, not the process of, of your position, but the process as to why we're here today. Why are we here today with this? We, we knew in November when it passed that 
that the 120 day clock, I don't even know who to address this question to. So uh, I could look to Mr. Boyle, I could look to our law department. We knew in November when this item passed that there was going to be at some point, depending when the 120 days would start, the requirement to bring a, a treasurer before us because of the interim status at the time of the election. Why are, why are we here today with this when we weren't with Mr. Parks? Well, I, I'll answer that as best I can. Um, turning your, your attention back to my previous comments, all positions are uh, publicly posted. And so, for example, I don't think anyone took for granted uh, Mr. Parks' confirmation, quite frankly. Uh, I mean, these are open processes, and I think that to that extent, um, you know, we didn't start searching for somebody for the treasurer position until that position became, became vacant. And I think that the appropriate thing is to have the best people <coughs> in place rather than the most expedient uh, and, and timely. The, the interim changes or the changes that were made regarding interim language in the, in the charter review process I think are appropriate um, so that an individual does not stay in a position with an interim status forever. Um, with that as a backdrop, I do think that, that this particular situation, the, the uh, administration is just trying to make sure that all the T's are crossed, all the I's are dotted, and that the appropriate people are before this council for confirmation at the appropriate time. Um, I mean, it's kind of a long-winded way of saying that th it's an open process and we just want to make sure that, that we are uh, in the best position to make sure that the county has the best public stewards. Well, then, Madam President, if I can, then did we expedite a process with the fiscal officer that we're not expediting with the treasurer? No, I don't, I don't think that's a fair statement. How many um, individuals have applied for the, when, when was this position posted and how many folks have applied? Off the top of my head, Councilman, I don't know the answer, but I will get you an answer, obviously. And, and just to reiterate, you want, when was it posted and number of applicants? Very good, thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Como? Uh, Greenspan answered, asked one of my questions, but um, Ms. Wright, were you interim director before, previously? I'm not Did sure. you play an interim director role before uh, when the county was changing? No, this is my first position as interim director. Okay. Uh, did you apply for this treasurer's position? I have recently made application for the position, yes. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, if there are no other questions, I'll entertain a motion to move this item to the regular agenda for first re for a second reading adoption. Thank moved. Mr. Harrison moved and seconded by Mr. Miller. All right. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Um, we'll, you'll be on the agenda for Tuesday. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Item 0008. Okay. Madam Chair, this doesn't happen too often, but I got stuck with the uh, cut and paste bug here. So okay. it should read ordinance number 2014-0008, an ordinance enacting the Cuyahoga County Voting Rights Law, updating the Cuyahoga County Equity Plan in Chapter 1101 of the Cuyahoga County Code in conformity therewith, and declaring the necessity that this ordinance become immediately effective. And I'd also like to recognize that uh, Councilman Sharon is in attendance. Um, is there someone from the administration that's going to speak on this? I assume that would be the procedure that the administration would speak for. Uh, I thought that happened the last time when the county executive was here. And okay. The, so, and this is a joint, actually, ordinance by council and the executive councilman. Okay, all right. Sonny Simon is the sponsor. All right, well, this matter is on then for, for discussion in, in the committee. Uh, are there comments or questions? Or Ms. Simon is one of the uh, sponsors, so do you want to start? Sure. Um, thank you, Madam President. Yes, I am um, proudly co-sponsoring this piece of legislation. Um, I've spoke on it already a few times. I'm not going to keep speaking on it. I, I just think it's one of the most important um, things we as a council can do to ensure that um, our residents, our voters, our constituents have the broadest ability to vote. And I think to go backward and restrict um, is, is not something that we as a county want to represent. I, I hope my colleagues um, join me in this. And I think it's, again, going to be historic, most important act of this council. Hey, thank you. Uh, Mr. Greenspan, then Mr. Miller, and then uh, Mr. Shrine. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, as my colleagues are aware, I sent a letter to the law director uh, with, with a number of questions. Some of those questions were answered, 
but some were not, so I'd like to ask those <coughs> questions now. Um, the, is it the administration's position that, that this will be a practice if this passes that will be offered at every election taking place in the county, meaning every February and August special election, every political subdivisions election issue, is it the county's position that that's what this will do? Uh, my understanding, and I did confer with the county executive on that, that that is the desire of the uh, county executive. That, of course, will be worked with the county council through the appropriation process. So the, you know, but the desire is that that happens at every election. But the funding for it will be done through the appropriation process. And you, and you actually led nicely into my next question. What, what are the projected costs for, let's, let's say, a, a general election in a gubernatorial or presidential year? What are the projected costs of this program? I, I don't have that data specifically for you because I think it will depend how it gets done. We need the law in place to be able to, to, to do the data. Uh, but I, and it varies from election to election, the, you know, the cost uh, and how you do it, whether we ourselves uh, mail them or whether you contract it out and you get an independent vendor to do it for you. Uh, I know in 2011, I don't know if Bonnie remembers, the cost has been reported in the newspaper. Uh, there was uh, some calculation for it in 2011. It was somewhere in the neighborhood of two, three hundred thousand dollars, I think, for the entire mailing. But I would say to keep in mind that this is not a new expense for the county. Uh, this is something that the county has paid for consistently for every election, including special elections, uh, since the uh, 2006 election, because the Board of Elections used to send out uh, these applications. So that's not a new expense. It's just a matter of moving the, uh, you know, the appropriation from one one place to another place, how you pay for them, but it's not a new expense for the county. So, so the answer is we don't know how much it's going to cost. We, we don't know the cost implication. I give you the best answer I can give you, I guess. I, 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 you know, we'll have to, to see what, what the, you know, when you bid out a contract every time until you get the bids, you don't know exactly what the, what the, what the cost is. Okay, so so we, don't, we don't know the cost is, is the answer. Again, it, it's gonna, I, it depends election to election. It depends on, uh, you know, I, I presume it's a varying cost, uh, but I, will, I don't know the exact cost well, for a specific election. Well, just further to your testimony, if this is not new to the county, then we should be able to identify what the cost of this would be to the taxpayers. We'll, we'll get you the data okay. on how much it costs uh, for all the elections since 2006. Great, thank you. Um, the, you know, I, I asked the question um, regarding this, if this legislation is in violation of state law. I didn't, I didn't recall seeing the answer in the response. Could I get an answer from that? Uh, I think the, the uh, actually there was uh, almost well, three pages of, of response to that, but the, the simple answer is as follows. Uh, when you are a uh, home rule entity, you have the ability to pass laws uh, on, uh, and the question whether the state law survives scrutiny uh, in a home rule analysis, the Ohio Supreme Court has articulated a four-part test uh, on whether the state law will survive a home rule analysis. The first test is whether the law is part of a statewide and comprehensive legislative enactment. Number two is whether the law applies to all parts of the state alike and operate uniformly throughout the state. Number three is whether the state law sets forth police, sanitary, or similar regulations rather than purport only to grant or limit power of a municipal corporation to set forth policy, sanitary, or similar regulations, which is exactly what this law does. It only purports to limit the ability of the local government to do something. And number four, it's whether the law uh, prescribes a rule of conduct upon citizens generally. The state law would only pass that home rule challenge if it meets every single one of those four elements. Uh, the case that I cited to you in the letter is a case from the city of Canton uh, where the state passed a law banning local governments from uh, regulating uh, uh, mobile homes. And what they did is they left a provision where you could do it by private deed. You can, uh, you can in a private deed, put a deed restriction where you limit uh, the, uh, the, you know, the placement of a manufactured home on that, uh, on that property, but they limited the ability of the city 
uh, to regulate manufactured homes. And what the Ohio Supreme Court did, it struck down that law because it found it to be violative of home rule powers uh, because of that private exception where they allowed the private parties to do it, but they forbade uh, the, the local governments from doing it. And they found that it failed, that made it, that made it fall under every one of those four elements that I read to you. That private exception made, it, made that state law fail. The current law that we're talking about in Senate Bill 05 does exactly the same thing. It allows private parties to go out and mail uh, the applications to vote by mail. It allows poli uh, political parties to do them. It allows private corporations to do them. It only places a limitation on a governmental abilities to do it. So whichever way you look under the city of Canton test that the Ohio Supreme Court articulated, that state law would not survive a home rule challenge. Uh, so I think the answer to you, does it violate state law? The question is, does the state law survive a home rule analysis? And I think our answer is the state law does not survive a home rule analysis because it only purports to limit the legislative power of the local governments. It doesn't regulate the citizens generally. It doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't prescribe a rule of conduct upon the citizens. <laughs> So, so in, in, in your citing of the Canton case, which relates to manufactured homes, and, and I know those who live in manufactured homes take exception to the word mobile home. Sorry. But no, that's okay. The, um, the, the question of applicability related to voting, is it the law department's opinion or the administration's opinion that the Beachwood versus Cuyahoga County Board of Elections is less relevant when it relates to home rule? than the Canton case of one which deals with, man, with uh, zoning and land use? Absolutely. Uh, and, a couple and, of things. Lot. Number one is the Beachwood case was a case about detachment of property. So you're dividing a city and creating two separate cities. So you are clearly outside of the jurisdiction uh, of the boundaries of your city. And the court said that when you're trying to pass a law that, that goes up, how cities operate, whether you have one city, two cities, that's a matter for the state to regulate. You were clearly outside the boundaries of your jurisdiction. And again, as I explained in that letter, that Beachwood case was even, even itself, while we pass every test under that Beachwood case, that case itself was even further limited in the, in the future case of Shaker Heights, uh, where our own Court of Appeals limited the, the uh, reach of the Beachwood case from 1958. Uh, the city of Canton case is a much more uh, recent case, and that is the test that the Ohio Supreme Court applies today. Not the law, the law, the law director's answers are, I think, were reduced to writing. So, do you have any more specific questions? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, let me um, look through my notes here. So, th the the discussion that that we had and regarding the the and first of all, let, let me start by saying, and as I said a few weeks ago, I'm clearly favor early absentee and in, in person voting. I'm concerned with the opportunity of maintain or, or, or the opportunity, the concept of creating a level playing field for something as fundamental as voting, uh, not only in the county and the state, but, but throughout the country where, where applicable. And I, I get concerned, and the reason I draw attention to that Beachwood case uh, and my further statement regarding the 17 crossover districts to which candidates will be on the Cuyahoga County ballot and 16 other counties let alone state issues, which are, are on all 87 counties, where our voters will have a different set of rules in the voting process. And as I said last time we talked about embracing the concept of, of equity as we have done and as we all supported in our equity ordinance, I challenged, number one, the concept of does that, does this ordinance itself provide an inequitable voting opportunity uh, for Cuyahoga County residents versus those in our 16 adjoining counties to which we share elections or on statewide issues, the 87 other counties. The other challenge that I have, uh, obviously the- well, I think that question was answered in, in Mr. McCoo's written responses. Yeah, and just for the public record, this is not a situation that this ordinance is creating. This is a situation that the state has created because the current state law allows private parties to mail it. So if the, if the Lucas County Republican Party or Democratic Party wants to send voters uh, application to vote by mail in Marcy Captors District only to the voters in Lucas County, there is nothing in state law that would bar that from happening. All what we're doing in this ordinance is we're providing an additional service to our citizens in Cuyahoga County. 
citizens in the local governments, and that's the whole idea of home rule, choose to pay for different services in there. We have some local jurisdictions where the citizens pay for recreation centers and, uh, and uh, swimming pools. Their voters are willing to pay for it. We have local jurisdictions that are willing to pay for services to their senior citizens. Their voters are willing to pay for it. We have the case of Shaker Heights where the voters are willing to pay for trash collection where the city comes in your backyard and, uh, and other, so that is a service that's simple. We're not trying to tell the Board of Elections what the Board of Elections can do. We're not trying to tell the state what the state can do. This is simply a service that we are providing to our citizens like any other uh, service that we provide to our citizens. I think the most stark example, Councilman Greenspan, is the Veteran Service Fund where we had a situation where state law put limitations on the Veteran Service Commission's ability to spend those dollars and what they can do. So through your leadership and through the leadership of this county, we stepped in and we said, okay, how do we provide services to, to our uh, veterans uh, because the Veteran Service Commission is, is restricted in what they did and we enacted the Veteran Service Fund. That's what we're doing here. The Board of Elections is restricted from uh, doing something. There is nothing prohibiting us as the county from being able to provide uh, that service to our fund. We did it repeatedly. We did it in the alternate construction delivery methods ordinance where we deviated from state law. Uh, we did it in the local uh, business preference ordinance where we deviated from state law. We did it in a number of areas. This is no different. This is a, this is not, we're not trying to regulate the business of elections. We're not trying to, we're not sending any ballots to our citizens. All what we're doing is we're providing a service to our citizen, no different than uh, when local governments uh, provide swimming pools, even if they want it to, to, to uh, their, uh, to their uh, citizens. I would just say we had the speakers from the League of Women Voters here, and I, I just, I'm deviating from topic a little bit because I Yeah, I, I think comes. that we, we have, you know, if we get more precise answers yeah. and key in. Mr. Yeah. Greenspan, do you have any other questions? Yeah, I, I, I do. Is it, is it the administration's position that, that postage is not considered something of value? Uh, I, you can take this to the bank as my opinion that we're that, that uh, us paying for the postage prepaid is not bribing the citizens. I didn't ask that. Is it considered something of value? It's uh, <laughs> it's a method. We're not. It's not something of value. But it's a yes or no question. Because unfortunately, we vote yes or no. So I'd like. Well, to, I think it, I think well, that, 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 it, it, that you have your opinion. Mr. Bakufa has indicated his opinion. So let, if you have, uh, let's move on because I think we have other people with questions. Okay. okay. I'll. I'll I may come back with further questions. All right, Mr. Miller. Madam President and, and my colleagues, uh, fair and accessible elections are fundamental to what it means to be a democracy. Therefore, I support this ordinance and would like to uh, respond to uh, some key questions that have been raised. One is, should Cuyahoga County be working to expand voter access and full participation? Well, it's evident that if you're a single mom raising three kids, working two low-wage jobs, and living in a neighborhood with gangs and drug dealers on the street, it's just a bigger challenge to vote. Our county government has equity and inclusion as a stated goal, and we should work to create conditions where it's easy and convenient for everyone to vote. Should voting procedures be uniform statewide? No, the policy should be uniform. The policy should be to conduct fair and accessible elections that enable full participation. Election boards should be given some flexibility to meet the, the needs of their constituents. Uh, does this ordinance violate state law or directive? It's not clear where the limits of home rule are. We already know that we may provide for the duties of various county officials that are otherwise provided for in state law, as long as we provide for all the duties to be performed. I'm for testing the limits of home rule. We need to know how far our authority extends. Even if the ordinance were found contrary to state law, the state law may well be contrary to the Federal Voting Rights Act, which trumps state law. Will the ordinance lead to litigation? I'm not deterred from right action by fear of litigation. However, Section 1 of the ordinance 
expressly authorizes the executive to promote voter participation, but does not direct any particular action. And section two amends a section of the equity plan that is clearly labeled as an aspirational statement. Therefore, I believe that the legal impact of this ordinance will depend on how it is used. I commend Executive Fitzgerald and Councilwoman Simon for bringing this legislation forward. Your commitment to fair and accessible elections has been steadfast and consistent over time. It is unfortunate that we even have to deal with this issue. Ohio made great progress from 2006 through 2012 on fair and accessible elections with bipartisan support. Now new state laws and directives threaten that process. The changes disproportionately affect the poor minorities and the homeless, and that's not what America is all about. It has been said that we should think globally and act locally. Self-determination through fair and accessible elections is what the world needs. This ordinance is our local response to that need. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, Mr. Gallagher has some comments, but he's going to submit them in writing for the record. Uh, Mr. Schrein? Uh, just to follow up on, the, the, I guess, some of the questions that were raised by Mr. Greenspan, is it your belief that since 2006, we've mailed out prepaid postage on both the application request and then the application return? Have we also mailed out the ballot and the ballot return in all four of those? Yes. Is that your testimony? The, the, with your the exception response? of with okay. the exception of 2012, what happened is um, in 2006, the, when the applications were when the ballots were mailed out, because it's a specific uh, size stamp, it's not a standard stamp. We were having the issues where uh, when people were mailing back the applications, the, the ballots, they were not putting the correct postage on it. So the Board of Elections started mailing out the applicants. We all received them. We're all, we all lived in Cuyahoga County whenever we had an election. I've received them. Uh, where, where you receive the, the application to vote by mail automatically with postage prepaid return envelope. If you fill it out, as I have done repeatedly, my, that's how I voted in 2010. That's how I voted in 2008. Uh, you got the ballot with the postage prepaid return envelope for... Uh, uh, for to send back the ballot, and that's how I personally voted during that time period. Okay, so this legislation will be addressing all four sides of the postage transaction? It, we can't do anything about the ballot itself because that's being mailed by the Board of Elections. So we can only do uh, what we can within our authority, which is to send in the applications uh, with the postage prepaid return envelope, but then the ballot itself, when it comes from the Board of Elections, if they don't put the postage stamp, then, then that would not be there. And where will the funds be coming from for this? Again, the, the appropriation process, that could be worked through the appropriation process uh, when that happens through. But this I, has been budgeted historically all through the year. So I, I, that will have to be worked out through the appropriation process. OK. And your, your response is that it's OK for the four congressional districts that are in Cuyahoga County to be treated differently in all the rest of the counties where they're voting for those same congressmen. Yeah, I, I think th that's where the confusion sometimes happens. There are two different things that, that sometimes get lumped together and they actually have nothing to do with each other. Uh, one is equality and equity and one is uniformity. Uh, and, and courts have recognized that, that uniformity, having a cookie cutter approach, sometimes actually results in inequality. Uh, so different counties have different needs. Uh, there are different population sizes. There are different transportation methods. There are different even uh, some uh, jurisdictions vote electronically. Some jurisdictions vote we have the, you know, the fill in the box. So you can't have exact uniformity for every single location. Uh, so the, all what we're, and, and keep in mind that currently under state law, that could happen very well because of a candidate can only send it to people within that uh, jurisdiction, you know, with it just the, the Marcy Capter example where somebody can only send them in Lucas County but not in Cuyahoga County or vice versa. That already exists. We're not doing anything that doesn't already exist, uh, the ability to happen. And courts in the uh, Van Zandt case uh, in federal court specifically 
it was the, that was the very issue. Those are all public dollars that you're talking about in every one of those cases, or are those private dollars? Well, the Van Zant case was public dollars. It was the board of, they were trying to challenge the, the ability of the uh, Board of Elections in Franklin County and Cuyahoga County to do that, and the court said different counties have different needs, and they have the, so they've upheld it for board, for even the elections entities themselves being able to, to send it separately. But most of your references have all been private dollars, have they not been, at least? I'm saying state law allows all those to happen. Right. Okay. And there was a comment up here that we should not be shy about challenging state law. Uh, is, are you in agreement of that also? Because that ultimately leads to litigation. I think what that comes on a case-by-case -case basis in the sense of a determination of a policy level in the county as to what issues matter to the county. And are you, if we are, believe you, are, you, are you stating that, though, that this will open us up potentially to litigation and then spending taxpayers' money to then defend ourselves in a litigation? Uh, we're open. I mean, you, any time we exercise home rule, we could be end up in litigation. I mean, honestly, Councilman, we could be end up in litigation about the alternate construction delivery methods law, whether we can do that or not. But as a policy question, we decided that, that we, it makes sense for us to deviate from, uh, from state law and, and, and uh, do it according to our practices. So every time, every time you pass a law, there is a risk uh, that you could be sued for it. You know, I don't know if that's, if that's the reason not to take action. I think Michael. I'm just, just asking procedurally. If you want to make a state, if, if you want to make a state, but now okay. then, I think you should make a. Okay, I, I, I'll finish up. That was my, yeah. my questions because I, um, I do believe uh, in fighting for greater access. As a veteran, uh, I can tell you that uh, I know deep in the heart of all those veterans who died to protect all of our rights to vote, and I hope we protect our veterans both domestically and when in overseas assignments with the same. Uh, excitement and, and veracity. However, rather than mailing out hundreds of thousands of pre-postage uh, uh, stamping that potentially leads to a lawsuit, as, as we're at least acknowledging here today, um, and to have different congressional districts being treated differently as all four candidates uh, running for office are all, all the candidates are going to be treated in Cuyahoga County different than they will be in Lake, Lorraine, uh, all the other different counties that they will be touching. Um, I can't vote for something that I think is potentially on the, uh, the illegal side. What we should be doing, we should be using the same energy and veracity and excitement and enthusiasm to try and change the state law rather than introduce ourselves in the middle of a lawsuit. I would suggest we use the same energy to go out and, uh, uh, and work to put online uh, registration, to use the tools of, of technology and to be able to do those same kind of things uh, out there that we're talking about here uh, rather than challenge the law. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Randall? You know, or originally, uh, one of my objections on this was uh, the fact that there's people that are going to vote. Uh, I don't know if you want to call them a habitual. Uh, you know, I happen to be one. I've never missed an election since I was able to vote. Um, so to mail me the ballot, uh, I thought was kind of a waste of money. But in, in looking at this, this whole controversy over, um, I've actually changed my mind on this, uh, the, the waste of money part. Because, uh, like I said last time, when I was commenting, all counties are not created equal. And, uh, you know, we've had Canaanites, Canaanite nights, and we've got all these judges running around making speeches, and it's confusing. And, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that being able to study this at your kitchen table and fill out a ballot is a heck of a lot better way of voting for judges. And the fact that in Cuyahoga County, we got judges coming out our ears in, in, in comparison to rural counties where they have to vote for one or two judges or one for each spot. It's not as confusing. Uh, so not all counties are created equal. So number one, I would say this. The state should have 
the lowest standard. It shouldn't put the highest standard because all counties are different. The other thing uh, where I changed my money, my mind about the money cost is the people that can't afford to take off work because they got to work or you've got to go and, and, and stand in line. Those people's time is valuable and it pales in comparison to what postage is. Um, and if we're gonna have crowded polling places, um, you know, people are gonna have to get off work early and so on and so forth. So from the money side, I'm convinced that the ability to take the time and vote by absentee mail, it, it's gonna cut down time for, for, for everyone, it's gonna cut down congestion at the voting place and we're valuing the, uh, the people's time. Madam President, if I may just very quickly, yes. with, with the issue of money, it's important to understand also, it's not like we're paying for every postage. I think the postage only gets paid if it's mailed back. So if, if the voter just throws it away, uh, we're not paying for that postage. But in terms of the total cost to the county, just to give you statistics, in 2004, Cuyahoga County had 577 voting locations and 1458 precincts. Because of the success of early voting and the vote by mail uh, processes that we had in place, they were able to reduce them to 423 voting locations and 1,063 precincts. So that's savings in voting machines that you pay for. That's savings in staff that you pay for. That's so you're actually making your money in the additional voting. But today, that is a very true statement. The voters per precinct is a higher ratio in Cuyahoga County than it was in 2004 when we had all the problems because of the success of the, the early voting program. Uh, Mr. Hairston. Madam Chair, I cannot sit here and not support this, this ordinance. So if I can be added to this ordinance, I'd appreciate it. Also, I've seen firsthand effects as the ward leader I've served the last four years in, in Cleveland Ward 10, the effects that of not receiving that application to their home, the, the drop in numbers of voter participation that has happened in my ward alone. And also looking at the numbers across the district, the, the dip and the decline in, in folks uh, voting by mail or just voting period is devastating. And I believe this body should do everything that we can to help alleviate those issues that we've had with uh, access to um, to voting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hairston. Any other questions, Ms. Simon? Just a final comment, Madam President. Thank you very much. Um, just when we talk about us risking litigation, that's exactly what the state did by passing um, an unconstitutional state law. So that's my first comment on that, and I'm not going to open the door to debate, but they, they, they fired the shot and they're, they're, they took the risk. I think our council um, has a choice when we talk about equity to protect our voters versus maybe somebody voting from you know, a different county. That's our choice, that's our equity. We saw what happened in 2004, so that's where our fairness and equi equity analysis should, should begin. And lastly, our council has the opportunity to do what's right, to do what's fair, and do what's equitable, so let's do it. And Mr. Fitzgerald has requested to have a moment. Yeah, just very briefly, Madam President. Um, first, I had to step out for a moment. I did want to just um, express the, my thanks to the council for your consideration of Jeanette Wright. She's done a, an outstanding job. On, on this issue, um, just a couple points quickly. One was on a factual question. I had asked Ms. Tewin what the estimate was in terms of our costs for uh, the 2011 uh, uh, elections that we were looking at. And at that point, we we're talking about approximately, uh, this is according to a quick estimate that we got, and we'll refine it and, and double check this, but the number that I was just given was uh, 700,000 absentee ballot applications. Um, now some of that work we can do in-house and we can do it pretty cheaply because we have a printing house in-house. Um, but the, the estimate that we got for the mailing service uh, that Ms. T. Wynn just gave me was $55,000. Secondly, um, regarding this issue of home rule, I think everyone here believes in home rule, and home rule has started to be eroded. But I can tell you that on a number of issues where we have tried to uh, exercise our powers under home rule, we've been threatened by litigation. So even uh, speaking of Ms. T. Wynn, when we said we were going to have uh, a public works director, we were threatened with litigation over that. 
When we said we were going to have a fiscal officer, uh, we were threatened with litigation over that. When we said we weren't going to have a separate uh, uh, coroner elected, w there were threats of litigation over that. Every time that under this system, or frequently under this system, as we have exercised the power that we have under a charter, we've been threatened with litigation. It's just whether or not do we believe in this principle or not. And th the last, and I think you know, maybe the most important point that I could make is uh, this whole issue about whether or not somehow this is an injustice to the residents of Lake County or Geauga County or Lorain County. We have the advantage of being to, able to compare two elections, 2004 and 2008. In the 2004 elections, it wasn't the residents of Lake or Geauga or Lorain that were at a disadvantage. It was the residents of Cuyahoga County that were at a disadvantage because these options were not available to them. It was the residents of Cuyahoga County that ended up sometimes having to wait in line until after midnight. So the old system, which we are now starting to revert to, was not an equal system in terms of results because it didn't allow different counties to devise programs that fit their communities. I wouldn't begrudge Lake County or Geauga County from devising rules that make it convenient for their citizens, and I would assume they're not gonna begrudge it if we're gonna devise rules that work for our citizens, but we don't. this doesn't have to be a theoretical discussion because we know what happened because we all saw it, and so did the rest of the country in 2004 when you had polling places open past midnight. So reverting to the old standard doesn't make a more equal system. It makes uh, for a, a more unequal system, um, in my opinion. So I, I, just th I just thought those points would be made. Thanks for your patience. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Mr. Brady had a comment. Um, I would just like to have my name added as a sponsor. Um, if there are no other comments, um, I will, yes, Mr. Uh. I'd also like to have my name added as well. And, and I am a product of the 2008 elections. I was a neighborhood team leader. I, I registered people to vote and I was constantly sharing with people, uh, vote at home. We know age, income, um, and education are the major factors in why people don't vote. And when someone comes to the polls and, and stands in line, and leaves to go back to work because they they couldn't they couldn't cast their vote before having to get back to work. The ability to sit at home and, and cast your ballot with your family around, your children around you, uh, it, it's it's um, invaluable. So I, I do support this legislation. Uh, the next motion we'll entertain is to move it to the regular agenda. So it will not actually be on the merits, but whether to move it on the agenda for adoption for second reading. Uh, is there such a motion? Um, Madam President. Second. Right, moved by Ms. Um, Simon and seconded by Mr. Miller. And let's call the roll on uh, moving it to the regular agenda. Calling the roll, Ms. Simon? Yes. yes. Mr. Greenspan? No. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. Mr. Germana? Yes. Mr. Gallagher? No. Mr. Schron? No. Ms. Conwell? Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Hairston? Yes. And Ms. Conley? Yes. Motion carries. That would be um, eight yeses and three noes. Madam President? Yes. I'd like my name added, please. And Mr. Miller's name. All right, this matter will be on for second reading adoption at the next regular meeting, which will be April the 8th. And this, uh, Madam Clerk, I'm going to pass you down Mr. Gallagher's comment. Second reading adoption. Jane, can you add my name? My name also. All right. All right, moving on to item 0088. And I think Mr. Uh, Applebaum is on the hot seat. Resolution number 2014-0088, a resolution approving a qualified management agreement with Hilton Management relating to management of a convention center hotel, authorizing the county executive to execute a qualified management agreement, a technical service agreement, a pre-opening services agreement, a room block agreement, and all other documents consistent with this resolution, authorizing and approving related matters, and declaring the necessity that this resolution yeah. become immediately effective. 
Shall I read all three, Madam Chair? Yeah, you can do that. Are you going to discuss basically all three? Are you going to read all three? Yeah. Okay. Resolution number 2014-0089, a resolution authorizing an amendment to the design build agreement with Turner Ozan VAA, a joint venture establishing a definitive guaranteed maximum price in the amount not to exceed at this point to be determined, for design build services for the Convention Center Hotel project for the period November 13, 2013 through September 1, 2016, authorizing the county executive to execute the contract and all other documents consistent with this resolution and declaring the necessity that this resolution become immediately effective. And resolution number 2014-0090, a resolution providing for the acquisition by lease purchase of real property, including a convention center hotel facility, authorizing a lease purchase agreement with respect to the convention center hotel facility, authorizing and approving other documents relating to the convention center hotel facility and financing thereof, and declaring the necessity that this resolution become immediately effective. Uh, Mr. Applebaum. We'll continue on with the second part of the presentation. Uh, if Tim Aftermat can't answer a question, we have Kate Tompkins, our bond counselor, who will back him up. And if they can't answer a question, we can go to Greg Huth. Is he the fourth string? Or? <laughs> uh, and if he can't answer the question, we go to Bonnie Tewin. So we have a lot of people here in the room, and, and Majid has also been very involved in the project. So we have a lot of people here who are involved in aspects of the project. Uh, my purpose today, though, is to kind of give you an overview of where we are uh, to talk about these three resolutions. Part of the presentation will be today. Part of the presentation will be on April 15th because there's certain information that um, uh, I either am not ready to give you today or frankly, it's not the appropriate time to give it because we have some negotiations that are going on between now and April 15th and uh, some information like financial information is not appropriate yet uh, to be in the public venue. And I'll explain that as I get through this. Thank so. Yes, Mr. Miller. Uh, are you going to send us a copy of, of this presentation? Yes. Yes. yes, you will have you will have a copy of the presentation, although you will not have, as you see here, this wonderful transitions uh, oh, that I now, okay. cool. do that now have in PowerPoint. That, that was cool. Do that again. <laughs> well, now I've taken most of these cool things out, but this is what PowerPoint 2013 gives you. So um, um, I apologize because there's going to be one that's even worse than that that you're going to see. So the agenda uh, of what I want to go through right now uh, is I'm gonna, we're going to talk a little bit about, once again, the timeline for council action. This is just a review of what I talked about last time I was before you. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the status of GMP development. I'm actually going to give you a little insight as to where we are in design, and I have some surprises for you that I think you'll like about design uh, development and where we are right now. Uh, then I'll talk about the qualified management agreement with Hilton, where we are on that, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Tim Oftermat to give you uh, sort of the preview of where we are on the financing plan uh, with some details that we're going to have to wait until April 15th to provide you, and we'll explain that. So with Oh, see, I, I hit the wrong button. I didn't, and now, now see, it, it's not going to be cool anymore. So now, um, so now, uh, this is, uh, well, <laughs> the process overview. I'm sorry. You see, it's too much of a toy on my, okay. Uh, this is the process overview. So you saw this last, last time I was here. We have three proposals that are going forward because there's three things that we're doing. Uh, the negotiation of the Hilton uh, Qualified Management Agreement uh, these were uh, presented, these actions were presented on March 25th from the last time we added this April 1st meeting. So I've simply shown this, this is an additional committee meeting that we added. I think uh, 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 Mr. Miller uh, was a little critical about the process because I didn't have the information before uh, April 8th. So that's why we're part of why we're doing this now. So we'll give you as much as we can today. You'll have your second reading on April 8th. I'll be back in front of you on April 15th with more information and then the third reading on uh, April 22nd. So that's with respect to the resolution for the Qualified Management Agreement. That's with respect to the resolution that will give us, with uh, our design builder, the guaranteed maximum price and enable us to enter into an amendment to their agreement where they guarantee the price of the project. And finally, that's with respect to bond financing. And I'm going to touch on all three of them today. So the one thing I do want to point out is while we're doing all this legal work, uh, construction is proceeding on the site. 
That, that, that's not a very good picture, but that was out of my window just before I came over today. Um, abatement is complete. Demolition now is complete. Excavation is complete. We have done the pre-coring for caissons, so we actually know what the length of these caissons are going to be versus what we thought they were going to be in the geotechnical report. And we have some, some caissons that are going to have to be longer, so there's going to be some, some this always happens with geotechnical work, some, some modification to our pricing, uh, nothing dramatic, but, but some cost. And what you're going to see right now, if you're looking out at the site today, and you can't see it because the, from my window, the global center's in the way, but there's actually mobilization for uh, the beginning of drilling of deep caissons. So material is showing up on the site. People are getting ready to actually put casings in and, and do the deep caisson foundations. That's what's going on on the site. At the same time, uh, and I don't expect you to be able to read this, this but what this is, uh, in, in the inclusion activities are ongoing. And you can, I can get, I'll, get, I'll give you this um, as a document, but what this really shows, uh, this shows all the planned activities for engaging uh, the, uh, uh, the minority community, the small business community. This shows the events that have already occurred in yellow, the purpose of the events, and we are out there. In fact, there's another event tonight, I believe. We're out there uh, engaging uh, uh, the uh, uh, minority community, the small business community, both with respect to workforce and with respect to <coughs> small business to get them engaged and lined up uh, uh, to, to see the areas where they can uh, be involved as subcontractors and as workers on the project. So that's all going on. That's not the focus today. And at a subsequent meeting, we'll, we'll come in and show you once again uh, the development of the inclusion plan. I just wanted to let you know that's all happening in the background while we get ready uh, for uh, the critical activities over the next four weeks. That's another one of those. So now, um, the GMP process itself. So first of all, what are we doing to get to a guaranteed maximum price? Well, what has occurred over the last several months as we've developed design, we've had repeated uh, meetings with the design builder, uh, Turner Ozan VAA. We've been going through all sorts of possible configurations of the project. We've been getting pricing. We've been looking at alternatives, uh, trying to get the project into budget. And there's always a challenge. I will just tell you this. I've never seen a project where we had a budget and we found out uh, that, the, that the architect designed to half of the budget that we have. The architect always challenges themselves. They put out a very, very uh, bold and dramatic design, and it's always a question of how can we afford it, and that's the process we're going through. Uh, and, it's, and it's the process you should go through, because you should be challenged to get every nickel you know, out, out of the design and out of the budget. So right now, uh, we've been going through this process, looking at different alternatives, different ways to do the building, while still keeping the program intact, keeping the basic building intact. We're at the point right now where uh, we are now getting the formal submission from Turner. We've had estimates and guesstimates, but now they're giving us the formal submission of the guaranteed maximum price. And we're going to see that previewed on Friday. We get the formal submission on Monday. Uh, that's going to include, uh, and that's step one. That's going to include their qualifications and assumptions, uh, everything that they are assuming and qualifying, because these are still, of course, it's not complete design. It's only design development. And then what they do is they're required to give us a road map to get back to budget. If we're over budget, uh, they're, they're, they have to give us ideas where they say, if you do X, we can reduce the price by X. If you do Y, we can reduce the price by Y. And this is built into the process. These are suggested value engineering solutions. We may accept them, we may not. We may challenge their pricing. There's a whole very detailed process we go through. Uh, once we get that, we go through a process of three weeks of a very intense reconciliation. And everyone is lined up. Everyone knows this is happening. We're actually going to occupy conference rooms in the convention center. Uh, dozens of people will be there from every discipline. Uh, we're going to be working morning to night. We're going to be turning drawings page by page, looking at pricing page by page, challenging it the whole way through. So these marathon meetings are going to go forward uh, for uh, two weeks. Um, uh, as I say, it's a page by page turn. During this process, we're going, there's going to be evaluation and resolution of pricing discrepancies. There'll be design alternatives discussed. Uh, there'll be uh, uh, proposed allowances discussed and modified. And at the end of this process, uh, we will reach agreement on a final GMP, uh, guaranteed maximum price, any design modifications required to get there, uh, anything revised in the qualifications and assumptions. This is a process that we go through uh, on every project like this. We did it on the Convention Center and the, and the Medical Mart. 
this is, uh, we do it on every stadium job, so this is part of a good, normal process. But that is the, that's what's going to be happening over the next several weeks. Uh, and by the way, as I've told you, if you want to come in and step into one of these meetings and just see it, uh, uh, you would be invited to come do it. Just let me know and, and, uh, and you can come over just if you want to, like I say, observe the sausage being made. Uh, this, is, this is when it happens. Uh, when we conclude that, uh, we will then, then step three is the documentation of the agreements reached. Uh, we will have sign off of everybody, uh, the design build team, our, our architect, our owner of uh, every agreement that's been reached uh, uh, during the reconciliation process. Uh, we will then be at our GMP, you know, design, uh, the guaranteed maximum price and the design will match. Uh, we'll then uh, prepare for execution the GMP amendment uh, to the design build agreement. And, and uh, with that, we will be presenting that to you. Uh, and that is the end result of your resolution on uh, authorizing or entering into the design build agreement. And obviously, you know, we have to produce a design that meets our programmatic criteria that satisfies Hilton and that is within a budget that the financing plan that Mr. Aftermath is going to talk about uh, can't afford. So that is that part of the process. Okay, just to preview. I'll have more about that on April 15th because on April 15th we will be substantially through the, that process and I will report to you where we stand on the GMP and what if anything uh, came out of the process that would be noteworthy. So that's where we are on the GMP process. Um, and look at this. <laughs> so now uh, we have the vista to design. I'm going to tell you a little bit about design. Oh, come on. You know, this is like the magician's tricks. You do it once and it's cool. You do it twice and, and it loses its, uh, its impact. But here we are. I, by the way, there's like 25 parlor tricks I have, and I'm only going to show three of them here because I got too caught up in this. All right, so where are we at on design? Uh, so I'm going to show you a few things. You can study this, and I'm going to try to get this pointer up here so I can uh, get my laser pointer up so I can point out a few things. So the first thing you see here, this is the overall design plan as we have it. And some of the key features here you can see, and this would be looking down from on top. So on top of the, so this is the tower, and this is the podium. And what you see on here is the green roof. That will be a green roof right now. That's still in our budget and in our plan. Uh, over here, this is a very interesting space out here. So this is the northeast corner right there, uh, which is outside of the uh, tower. And that's going to be, uh, in essence, uh, what we're terming a Zen garden. Uh, you'll see more about that. But it's a place, it's a, it's a very uh, nice area uh, for some contemplation. And it just is a very, very powerful, interesting space. Uh, that you'll see. Um, the restaurant entrance is right here, and you're at, there's actually going to ultimately, you don't see it yet, there'll be a canopy that takes you out from the drive to the restaurant entrance. This is at grade, uh, and uh, this will come into the restaurant at this level over here. I will tell you, and this is a little... Are you going to drive up this west wall? Or this Pardon? Can you drive up this west wall? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you can drive up the west mall, and you can drop off right at the restaurant. You can drive through. Okay, so that, 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 that we've made sure happens. Uh, Hamilton Court, this has gone through a little bit of an evolution. So you remember originally we had parking and Hamilton Court was closed off. It was just parking and you go down into the building. Well, now what Hamilton Court is, we still, there is going to be an area in here where you can still uh, drive in uh, at certain times of the day, not, not the public. This is for uh, supplies. So vans can drive in. That's where trash collection will be inside here, uh, and that there'll be limited uh, ability to supply the building from Hamilton Court. There's also ability to come down, uh, down below and supply the building from down at the lower level. But, but this also will be done in such a way uh, that there will be uh, the ability of a pedestrian to come through. This will be uh, very nicely done, separated from where any uh, vehicle will come in uh, there'll, be the, there'll be an access way here for pedestrians to come through Hamilton Court and come into the malls that way. Um, to give you an idea, and by the way, so there will be a walkway that comes up to here where you can come into the building. As I say, this is the entrance to the, uh, to the restaurant. Crosswalk over here to get over to parking. There'll be more development of that. Um, uh, to get an idea of the Zen Garden, here you see some of the planning materials and concepts that will be in that garden. 
And uh, we, we'll, we'll show you more of this later in a design presentation. I'm not, if I, if I go through this in detail, I'll be here for too long. Uh, but you see some of the concepts, some of the planning materials, and some of the concepts for the Zen Garden. Um, I, I've been told that I, I personally need to be around a Zen Garden. Uh, so I don't know what that comment meant by the people who told me that. Um, the, uh, the East Terrace, uh, there's going to be plantings on that East Terrace. These are some of the concepts of the, of the uh, materials, the plant materials, uh, and some of the uh, uh, concepts that will be in the East Terrace planning. Are these Ohio-based plants? <laughs> I think we should, you know, just, well, that, that was just a little thing off the side. Of I'll, get back, I'll get back to you on that. I can tell you all of these are in Ohio, because we have, I, I know I have a bunch of these stuff, but I don't know if they're, I don't know if they started here or not. Um, but uh, but I'll, 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 I'll get back to you on that one. Okay. Um, so now, uh, very quickly, I want to just take you uh, at the lowest level of the building, uh, and there have been a lot of modifications on levels B1 and B2. This is not something that, that the public will be concerned about. This is mostly back of the house space and when we redid the foundation system. But on the lower level, basically what occurs uh, is uh, you're coming in from the convention center, you come into an entry area, and you're going to come up escalators, up steps, up elevators. The rest of this is back of the house. That's where the laundry is down there and other back of the house space on the lowest level. Uh, as you come up, um, you come up into this level. Now, this is hard to understand here. I'm simply going to tell you, and then I'll show you some renditions. Uh, when you come up into the lobby, this yellow area is all open space. Uh, you come in the front door. This is the reception area. There's bars up above. Uh, the restaurant or, or the areas up here. Uh, this is actually on the lower level. This is a, the concierge lounge. This is sort of the, uh, a lounge which is for those people who are Hilton Club members and things like that. That's on that level because we've preserved the upper level where that might be for something more special, as you'll see in a few minutes. A lot of back of the house space there. Um, I'm not going to bother with this slide. This kind of shows you the cross section and what you get uh, an idea of down below there are some of the kinds of materials. Um, uh, th these are the materials uh, that are going to be used in those lobby areas, and I'm going to tell you the theme. We have a theme of using things which are Cleveland, industrial, if you know anything about, um, you know, the Schreckengast, uh, uh, his, uh, you know, industrial art types of things from the, um, uh, that school. It's all those sorts of things. Bridges. Uh, steel, industrial, that kind of a feel, still very, you know, very artistic, but the kind of the feel of what, what, you know, the solid Cleveland sort of feel. And these are the kinds of materials and looks that you'll see that we're trying to develop there. Um, now, be careful of this because these are not renderings. These are just kind of spatial images. But this kind of gives you the idea of what some of this will look like. So in this particular case, uh, in the interior, uh, this is looking from the side, the front doors to the left. Those columns are actually going to be light columns. So if I was looking at the front desk, uh, the front desk has that curved space down <coughs> below here. There will be a green wall behind that. We want to bring in the idea of lake, metro parks, green, just like the green roof. Now this will all be very stylishly done. You don't see any of the finishes here. You're just seeing a space plan. So this is not intended to be a pretty image just to g give you spatial ideas. Up above here on the second level, uh, that's where the lobby bar is going to be out there, and people can look out over the lobby. There's some very special features about this lobby bar. There'll be a mixology station where people can come out and see the, what the bartender actually does, you know, concepts like that that are very cool. Um, uh, these are the kinds of materials, the furniture concept uh, of the types of things that you may see in the lobby, including the green wall on the right. There'll be more time to look at these later on, and we'll have a presentation on this. Um, once again, another view uh, of this lobby concept. This is from the side. That's the front door that way. Behind that is where that uh, reception area is. These columns will be light emitting columns, very cool. And this doesn't tell you anything about the furniture or the fixtures or the, or the, or the finishes in there, but just gives you sort of the concept of what this will be like. It's going to be extremely, uh, I mean, it's, it's going to be very, uh, when you walk in, it, it'll have a real wow factor to it. Uh, the, the monumental stair going from the first floor to the second floor where the bar is 
where restaurants are. These are just some of the space concepts that'll be in here. And I almost hesitated to show you these because these are not yet the renderings that, that show you the wow factor. They're just kind of, they show you the space and some of the elements, but you'll get the idea. Um, the second level uh, is the restaurant bar level. So up here, that's the restaurant or the bar that's on top of that reception area. These are places where people will be in the bar. This is where the restaurant is. It's one level up from the entrance here, but at this point, it's at the ground level here. So that's where you can walk in. You'll have terrace out here, you'll have areas out here where people eat outside, but they'll be up here and they'll, look, they'll, they'll be looking down to people in the reception area below. So this is, and this is all open space. This white space is all open space to what's happening in the lobby down below. And this is a lot of other functions in back of the house space. So you can have some idea of what that's gonna be like. Um, uh, I'm not gonna bother with this slide. Uh, the restaurant concept, uh, once again, uh, this is just a layout of the restaurant. That's gonna be further developed. Some of the, uh, the, the concepts, so this is gonna be sort of a, a farm to hearth type of idea, the idea of using farm, you know, uh, Ohio-based, uh, uh, you know, vegetables and things like that. Uh, it's really a, a great concept that we're working on with Hilton right now, but more about that later. Some of the, uh, once again, some of the concepts in terms of finishing and look of it, you see a few ideas here on the right, but that's still under development. As you go up, the next level up is the junior ballroom. We're now the third level up in the podium. Uh, this is all meeting space and ballroom space. Uh, you're gonna have vistas uh, out here, light. One thing which is different, before this area right here where those meeting rooms are, those meeting rooms weren't there before. That was just all open to the lake. Uh, our thought was that we're gonna put meeting rooms right there so you can be in a meeting room and be in a meeting room and look out at the lake. We thought that's a lot more valuable because basically this junior ballroom is generally closed. Anyway, so we have better meeting room space. It's a more efficient use of space. You still have these light views here, 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 and it's a very efficient space on the third level. Uh, that's the junior ballroom level. Go up one more level. Now this is the grand ballroom, which will be uh, the second largest ballroom in Cleveland other than the the ballroom in the convention center, and you can see it's divisible in many ways. And once again, we have meeting rooms here that you look out at the lake. So this is the, these are the two meeting room levels on the podium. Um, as we continue up, now we're starting to see the tower. And one of the very cool features here, the sixth floor, which is the, the first floor of the tower above the podium, this is also the recreation level. So here, this is gonna be pretty dramatic. Uh, we have the gym, uh, uh, physical fitness area, that's gonna overlook the mall that way. And the pool will be a very cool space. The, the northern half of this will be a pool. And this pool will overlook, overlook Lake Erie. So you'll be in the pool and you'll have a vista north to the lake, out this way to the lake, out this way to the city of the city. So this pool is going to be a very, very uh, interesting space with vista out to the city. We then start up, and these are simply the routine uh, layouts of the floors, seven to nine, 10 through 13, 14 to 17. And this just, if you want to study it, it'll show you where the suites are, the kings, the rooms with kings, queen, queen, and things like that. Um, just a little concept, these are some room layouts. You may want to look at this as you have time. Uh, once again, some of the furnishing concepts. One of the things that we think we're gonna do is as a backdrop here, uh, behind the beds we'll have things, or on the walls we'll have things like this, which would be a map, sort of a layout map of Cleveland or Cuyahoga County, some historical stuff, some really interesting uh, things like that that will be in these, in these rooms. And there'll be, there'll be a presentation on interiors later on. I'm just giving you an idea. Pardon? Do we have an eight Ohio presidents? Uh, we could. <laughs> Do you like them all? Yeah. All right. If you like them all, okay. Um, these are some of the uh, guest room furniture concepts. Once again, getting into this sort of industrial uh, Cleveland uh, uh, art type of stuff uh, that you'll see uh, that we're, we're planning on. We think these rooms are gonna be very cool, by the way. Um, we are also going to, because of the influence of the, uh, the global, uh, our, our Global Center for Health Innovation, we are going to have some, what we refer to as healthy guest rooms. We're gonna have some rooms we're going to have a yoga themed room with yoga equipment and if you want to be in that room, uh, you can be in those rooms. We're gonna have a cardio room 
The cardio room, as you can see, will have equipment in it, which is cardio equipment. Uh, and what we're initially going to do, we have found out, not only is this something that we think goes with our theme, we have found out that these rooms generate revenue, people pay to stay in rooms like this. We're going to start out with a small number of these rooms. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the room block, the room size itself, you don't have to modify the room. What's modified is the furniture and fixtures in the room. So we're going to probably start out with four or six of these rooms that are available. If we find out that people want them and want to pay to be in them, we can always increase the number of these rooms. But we think it's important as an option to be able to show that we have health, uh, uh, this healthy guest room concept and it's available to guests and we'll just see what the demand is. Uh, uh, the, the study has shown that these things will pay for themselves within a year because people do pay uh, to stay in these rooms and, and it pays for the equipment very quickly. The only question is how big the, how big the demand will be. So that's a concept that we are now introducing into, into the hotel. Pardon? Not yet, but, but now that you mention it, we'll have you, we'll have you talk to our folks. Uh, right. Well, I think that when we start this concept, I think we're going to have a, fl uh, a flood of ideas. Now, Hilton has to approve of what we put in there, of course, uh, but that's something that we're, gonna, we're, we're looking at right now. Um, as we go up uh, on the levels, uh, you know, eventually we get up to those levels where, as you remember, the, the building carves at the building goes like this. You actually can look down, and we have some very, our most impressive suites are up on the upper levels. And I think the most exciting thing that we're now doing the last time I talked to you, uh, on the 31st level, not at the very top, we had some meeting room space. Uh, what we are now doing all the way at the top, on the 32nd floor, we now have what you see labeled here as the sky bar. We are going to have a rooftop bar. Uh, let me tell you the significance of this sky bar or rooftop bar. First of all, it's going to be the northern end of the building. Uh, you will be able to sit up there and you will have a view, an extraordinary view of Lake Erie, of the town. It has an exterior portion, a terrace out there that will be open. Uh, and we are exploring having it open most of the year. We have an ad alternate in the pricing that actually would enclose it and it would be open all year long. Uh, during the summer months it would be open. It could be enclosed in the winter. We're exploring the cost of that. But ev even, uh, in the, uh, ev even if we don't do that in the fall months, we have concepts of having things like fire pits and heaters out there where people want to go out there. Uh, this is open to the public. Uh, so one of the things that was important, the last concept we had, uh, which had meeting room space, that was private meeting room space for conventions. This is a concept of a restaurant open to the public. Uh, you're going to need reservations because we think it's going to be a, a, a hot item. Uh, and obviously, you're going to have to check in. You know, There'll be an elevator at the bottom of the building that will be manned because when you check in, uh, you, have to, you have to get through security to go up because this, this is also going in areas where the, where the elevator is secure, but that's not unusual. That happens in a lot of uh, hotels that have these kinds of rooftop restaurants and rooftop bars. We're very excited about it. Uh, what you see here, now this is just a hand drawing. We're still working on the concept. Uh, now, on this drawing, north is to the left. But basically what we have there is we have the bar there that seats 14 or 15. Uh, within the enclosed part of the restaurant, we have tables uh, that seat about 58, and on the terrace, we seat another 25. Uh, so that would be the kind of capacity we would have here. And keep in mind, those seats that are on the east side, which is at the top, the windows go out like this. So when you're sitting there, not only are you looking out, you're looking down. So it's going to be the most dramatic view you can imagine in Cleveland. Uh, this is going to be themed. Uh, we're working on the kinds of themes for this restaurant. There's been different things that have been suggested that we're working through. It will be a full service bar, but it may, it, by way of example, it may be themed around wine and you may actually have those, if you've ever seen the kinds of uh, dispensers and things where you can get, you know, different, you know, wine on tap type of concepts. One thing we're thinking about, there's a concept that, de that deals with bubbles and pop where maybe, uh, and by pop I'm talking about, you know, there's this concept, it's not my concept by the way, I don't like the concept, but it's the idea that you would have, uh, you know, uh, a feature of beverages that are bubbly like champagne, you can even have non-alcoholic sodas, you know, fancy kinds of sodas, but there's different concepts. Hilton is working with us on the theming and some branding as to what we're going to do up there. Whatever we do, it's going to be a pretty extraordinary space and it's going to be, uh, I think, in terms of Cleveland, physically it'll be the best bar in Cleveland and hopefully it'll be run as the best bar. We also think it's a very big revenue generator. And one of the reasons that we're doing this is because we think that the revenue generation will justify it. 
Um, so now these are some renderings. The renderings haven't been updated from the last time you saw. By way of example, on this level, uh, that bar, that's still the meeting room space. That's actually a level below where the rooftop bar is. So a, a, a current rendering would move that up and it would look a little different up there. But the rest of the building is pretty much the same right now as you saw before. Um, you know, that wonderful space where you look in and see the four levels of uh, the lower level, uh, the bar level with the restaurant, uh, the, junior, uh, the junior ballroom, the senior ballroom, that's looking into that space and looking out from all those, those venues. The road. The driveway to come up to the restaurant. Oh, it's right here. It's, what you don't, what you don't see here. Seeing the headlights moving. Yeah, the, and by the way, they're not going to move so fast that they will do that. That's. Yeah. Yeah, but this has not yet been developed to show the restaurant uh, area here. This is an older rendering. We haven't redone the renderings. This doesn't show the canopy. This doesn't show the entrance to the restaurant right there. And like I say, they're on the back because these are older renderings. They haven't been up, updated, but they're not that. Of the building itself, they're pretty close. The 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 the. the What's changed is, is minor. So, uh, but these will be updated, but once again, these are 95% accurate. The, the essential massing and the curtain wall and everything is pretty much the same. So that's a little bit about our design. Uh, I like that image, uh, but that's kind of what you're gonna see as we move through it. So now, now we go from the exciting to the relatively dry. So now I'm going to talk about where we're at in negotiation of deals. So, well, this is, I, I'm not sure what order you had them in. I think the first item you had was the qualified management agreement, as I recall. Uh, what I just went through, what I've told you about so far is where we are in design. I gave you the roadmap for getting to the guaranteed maximum price. Is that the second thing or the, I'm not sure if that was the second or third, the way you read them, I don't remember. Uh, so, that, so I've, I've kind of been through the second item. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to the first item, which is the qualified management agreement with Hilton, and then we'll go to the third item, which is the financing plan, okay? Qualified management agreement, and I will tell you that we are in negotiations sort of round the clock uh, with Hilton. Uh, those negotiations involve uh, lawyers from my office, Robin Minter Smyers and I are involved with that. It involves our bond counsel. Uh, uh, Kate's very involved in that. Uh, David Goodman, her partner's involved with that. Uh, we have another uh, lawyer uh, who is our special consultant on these things uh, uh, out of Denver, who is my sub-consultant who's helping us uh, with these things. Uh, Greg Huth has been involved with these things. Uh, Tim Oftermat uh, pretends he's a lawyer and gets involved with these things in these meetings. We're all involved in these negotiations. So, and, the, and these are, there's some very tough issues uh, because uh, um, some of these issues involve uh, very legal issues, you know, the extent to which, how, how, you know, if a county can't formally indemnify, how does a county protect Hilton's interests? How do they protect our interests? And these are, these are legal issues that are very in-depth uh, and they're of great interest to the lawyers uh, and very important, but um, they, uh, you would, you would fall asleep uh, if you got into them. a lot of tax implications and things like that. But let me tell you the essence of where we are right now. Oh, this is something I didn't tell you yet, and I should have told you. Um, the name of the hotel has been agreed upon, uh, or we have agreed with Hilton as to the name of the hotel that they insist upon. Uh, but, uh, pardon? No, that was not. That wasn't even on the list, as I recall. Um, uh, Hilton has a protocol for naming, and this is very important to them, and it has to do now with what happens when people search. They want people who do Google searches or other searches or who, who get on GPS to be able to put in a hotel name, find it, and make sure they get to the right place. So the protocol is, number one, Hilton always has to be the first name. The second name is the name of the city, Cleveland. The third name is the name of the location. So it's Hilton, Cleveland, downtown. Pardon? Wasn't the Conrad Hilton? Well, Conrad Hilton was the first. Uh, well, the first Hilton Hotel was in Texas, and it was Conrad Hilton who ran the company. But and there are there is a chain called Conrad, but that's a 
Uh, that's like a, that's, that's up there with Waldorf Astoria. Uh, but for, for a convention center hotel, they're Hilton. So it's Hilton Cleveland downtown. Uh, and, and, and that's the protocol. And it's also, they tell us, it, 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 and it, 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 there's an elegance to it. This is actually, uh, what you're seeing here is one of the monumental sign designs, which would have Hilton Cleveland downtown, whatever the name of the restaurant is, and things like that. So that's part of it. Um, I, I suppose this is a wise idea in France if it was, if it wasn't the Hilton Paris, I guess it would be the Paris Hilton, which would be confusing, but that's how they do it. Oh. Da, da, da. But anyway, that, that is the protocol, and that is, that is, I was waiting for that. That's the hotel name. Uh, now, uh, once again, we know that the expected opening of the hotel, June 1, 2016, we're working for a sub substantial completion date uh, of the building uh, uh, two months ahead of that. The term is 15 years uh, with three 15-year renewal options, and that's already baked into the deal. Uh, hotel revenue, the, the, reven the hotel will generate significant revenue. That revenue will pay operating expenses, including Hilton's base management fee and their brand services fee, because there's a lot that Hilton provides. Uh, the basic brand services are initially uh, at, pegged at about 4% of room revenue. Uh, any excess goes to the trustee for use for hotel and payment of debt service. Uh, Hilton does get a base management fee, and we've negotiated what those fees are in year one. And you can see at year one, they get $639,000. And you can see how that grows to year four, one million two, and then that's adjusted by CPI. That's their fee to manage the hotel. Um, the after they get the management fee, then comes our priority payment. So of the revenue generated, there's an amount of money which then goes to pay debt service. Um, we, we have not put the spe <coughs> specific number in. We think we have that number locked in with Hilton. Uh, there are some things that are going on that could modify it slightly, but uh, essentially uh, that, that number is in the, uh, uh, let's say it's in the eight to nine million dollar range. Uh, worst case is in the seven to nine million dollar range, but that's the amount of money that comes out for debt service. And after we pay the expenses, and Hilton's base management fee, that all goes to debt service. If and when, uh, uh, if and when that's all paid off and the, and the hotel is generating revenue beyond that, uh, there is a subordinate management fee. In other words, Hilton splits its management fee, that which is guaranteed, then our priority payment comes and then part of it is variable. Uh, and this is, it's subject to a lot of tests. The priority payment has to be made uh, and they also have to satisfy a RevPAR performance test. In other words, what we do is there's a competitive set of hotels, and uh, we are negotiating what that competitive set is. Certainly, the Marriott's in that competitive set. The New Western will be in that competitive set. They have to uh, perform at a number which is very close to what that competitive set performs at. Uh, it's a number that will be very close to 100% of what the others perform. Let's say it'll be between 95 and 100% of what that is, and we're just fi finalizing the negotiation. They have to be at least at that level, uh, and have to have and we had to have had got, got uh, get all of our money out for our debt service for them to get the priority uh, or uh, the subordinate fee. And you can see in the first two years they don't get anything, and then in years three to five. Uh, that can be another uh, million point four uh, adjusted. Now keep in mind that they're only getting that if their performance is up to a level and if we're getting all of our money out. And then uh, if they get that fee, then beyond that, if there's any money left over, that comes back. Uh, and, and the projections show that there could be money and will be money beyond that. So that's that deal. Jeff, uh, I, yes. heard, I heard that, but I didn't understand what a rev par Right. What okay, revenue cars test is so what you do is you basically look at the other hotels and uh, basically it is, uh, there is an assumption as to what this Hilton will generate in terms of how much they're going to charge get per room times occupancy. So if the average room rate is $160 per room and if you have 75% um, uh, occupancy, your, your rev par is 75% times 160. We compare that to the rev par that the competing hotels are, are getting. Okay. If they are below a percentage, and I'm going to throw out a number, 99%, okay, if they're below 
which you may well find in the final deal, uh, then they don't get this priority payment, or not the priority, they don't get their additional fee. If they're above that level, which means they're performing, uh, out, at least- Outperforming the other yeah, hotels Yeah, or at least the meeting or outperforming them, meeting then they can get okay. a subordinate fee. Okay. If they do that, and if we're also getting all of our money out for debt service. So they only get that fee, they only get that portion of their fee if their performance justifies it and if it meets all of our needs, okay? Uh, now, Jeff, uh, how long is our debt service again? Uh, well, the the, uh, the bonds will be, and t uh, Tim will talk about this, but the bonds will be 30-year bonds, but we'll let Tim talk through it. 30-year bonds, but Tim will talk about that. Uh, we will have a termination right uh, if they do not perform. If, uh, in any, if after the fourth year, if any two consecutive years they fail, we don't get our priority payments because it underperforms, or that rev par is less than the competitive set, uh, and if they fail to cure, there's some ways that they can cure, but if they fail to cure on two occasions, we can terminate. This is something we haven't revealed before. I told you early on that Hilton uh, uh, put some money into the deal, upfront money. Uh, the amount of upfront money they've put into the deal is $4.75 million. That is their commitment because they understand that for us to build it, uh, you know, to have the, 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 the money to develop it, uh, we're looking at different sources of revenue, so uh, they believe that the deal on the back end justifies the investment, so their front end investment is $4.75 million. And I will tell you that that is, uh, if you look at comparative deals right now, that's a hefty investment. Uh, Hilton didn't start out near that. They believe in this project. So their commitment to put in four, almost $5 million should tell you about their belief in, in this project. Uh, th there's also a guarantee uh, from their parent, uh, Hilton Worldwide. Now, there's a lot more uh, going on uh, with that agreement, but those are some of the fundamentals. There's a series of ancillary agreements. We're also negotiating with them. There's uh, simply a technical services agreement. They've been giving us, they come to every meeting. They're involved. They've been involved nonstop in this. We talk to Hilton every day. We were with them for a few hours today at our regular weekly meeting. Uh, so uh, they've agreed to a technical services agreement where they provide all that. They've, they've agreed, however, to deferred compensation. It's a $250,000 fee, but it's contingent on our getting this deal done. If we don't get this deal done, they have actually committed probably, I don't know, already half of that already uh, without any guarantee. Uh, there's a pre-opening services agreement. Uh, as we get into operations, there's a lot of things that out of the uh, debts out of the debt service that we have to take care of uh, and we agree with them on what those things are this is all the uh, and this is uh, what you know all the expenses for pre-opening advisory services uh, setting up programs licensing testing operations and there's simply an agreement that says what what we what they say we has to be provided what we agree to provide and how that's funded but that's all part of the operational cost excuse me and then there's something very important that we're negotiating which is the room block agreement uh, this is the agreement that says, Hilton, uh, you can't just sell rooms as you please. You have to reserve for periods of time blocks of rooms uh, for our convention center. So you have to keep, you, you know, you can't go out there and sell rooms three or four years from now. You have to put those on the side because the first priority is our convention center at, at a certain block at a certain discounted rate. <clears throat> so that's, part, that's also an agreement that we're in the process of negotiating right now. Those are the ancillary agreements with Hilton. So unless you have questions on that, and by the way, we will be back again. I'll be back again on the 15th with a little more detail on where we're at. But we're right in the middle of these very heavy-duty negotiations with them. The agreement's that thick. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of provisions that we're negotiating. Uh, none of them are easy. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it's just, it's, uh, it's a challenge because everything we do, we have to look at the tax implications. We have to look at the implications for bond financing. Uh, Hilton's aggressive and uh, as any hotel would be and it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting process. But at this point in, to, in time, if you have no questions on that, uh, I'll bring uh, Tim up to talk about the financing plan and I'll, I'll be available to answer questions either during Tim's presentation or when he's done and Tim, that is the button. Okay. And by the way, the one thing I did learn about doing this on surface that I forgot about, I think it's so cool to have this, but the screen's really small. So you have to have good eyes to be able to read this. Madam Thank Chair, uh, to Mr. Applebaum. Oh, yes. Uh, 
just kind of a threshold question. The third ordinance we have here saying a resolution providing for the acquisition by lease, lease per, purchase, et cetera, et cetera. Is that the financing piece, or is the financing piece a different piece of legislation that we don't have here today? Uh, well, that's involved, that's involved it's with the, it. It's uh, the uh, there's more, there's, there's also, that is the financing piece. Uh, there's also, and I think you should make mention of also the cooperative agreement and how that fits in. But yes, that is the financing piece. Tim can explain, he'll explain that as he goes through his, his slides. Madam. Yes. I just had a quite, a more of a design question. And, and <coughs> so I, I noticed that you mentioned that, that in the design of the hotel, that the ballroom will be the second largest other than that to which is in the convention center yes. itself. If, if the intent, as I understand, this hotel is to supplement, mm -hmm. and to, or I shouldn't say supplement, to complement the convention center, why would we com be competing against ourselves for facilities? Why wouldn't we want to direct hotel guests into our own convention center space? Well, that's what the room block agreement does. But keep in mind, the reason that you have, uh, the, the reason that these survive this way, I think we went through this before. In your, in your hotel, uh, when you have a major event, you have a few days of setup, then you may have three days of convention, then you have two days of breakdown. While that's going on, so you can only actually have active conventions during that middle period. The way it works with your convention center hotel, um, you want people to be in the hotel all the time. So the way it works is while you reserve time in the hotel to support your conventions, on those days when you're not running your convention center, uh, you're not using your large ballroom, they're using their ballroom. So what happens is when theirs is up, yours ideally is setting up for the next meeting uh, and, and they work in tandem. So, and what has happened, the experience has been, there have been convention centers where the convention center hotel said, we'll just rely on the, on the ballroom in the convention center, we won't do our own ballroom. And they've found that that has been actually a formula for underperformance because what happens is they can't, they can't keep the flow of guests going, they can't keep the revenue up. Ideally, they work together, and that's part of the marketing strategy. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Madam President, members of council, uh, I'm Tim Oftermat. nice to be with you again. Uh, I'm a managing director here in town with Stiefel Nicholas. County has appointed us to be the senior manager for the financing for the hotel project. Um, this thing isn't gonna have crinkly things no, or I, curtains or. I, I made, just so you know, I made this very plain so that by comparison to me, you look very plain, so it's very thank, plain. Thank you very little. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the, the financing generally uh, is meant to uh, be constrained by the, if you will, the, uh, the financing components of the convention center project that were originally put in place in 2007. Uh, the, uh, the sales tax, the quarter percent sales tax, the 1% uh, hotel tax, uh, the agreement with Positively Cleveland augments the various pieces of the hotel financing itself which is the Hilton payments. Uh, you, I suspect you've heard some of this stuff before. Uh, the, hotel, the city and county hotel taxes themselves that are levied on every hotel property uh, in the city or the county respectively are recycled into this particular building to pay debt service. Uh, the building is, the, the property is also TIFT, if you will. Uh, uh, as many other properties in the county are TIFT, uh, and there are specific arrangements uh, with the city that uh, are put in place to facilitate the TIF. Um, our, in, ad in addition to structuring the financing arrangements for the county um, uh, so that they meet the budget requirements for the project, uh, we started with the convention center uh, financing plan. Uh, 
Uh, I was the senior managing bond underwriter on that too and spent a lot of time with county representatives assembling those financing plans. Uh, I'd like to say we were brilliant, but we were lucky uh, primarily in that uh, if you recall back uh, in 2010, at the time that the county did those financing arrangements, there was uh, uh, in place at the time the federal support of the Recovery Act, um, which provided for significant federal subsidy or, or the ability to access tax exempt rates instead of taxable uh, bond rates for financing the hotel, coupled with uh, a few other things uh, that uh, I'll chalk up to some good work as well as some luck, conservative financing projections, uh, uh, conservative estimates of the sales tax and the hotel tax, and some uh, quite excellent execution on the construction of the convention center project. Combined, uh, those allow us to access up to about $58 million worth of funds uh, that the county has that allows us to utilize those monies generated by the hotel itself uh, and make the financing happen. Some of these monies, I should note, at least our current plan, is that they would be recycled yet again for some reserve funds uh, and used in case for uh, construction contingencies or possibly for uh, uh, contingencies on collection of future revenues. Uh, some, of, uh, some of that 58 million is a reserve fund that the county currently uh, has, okay, at its, uh, uh, at its disposal. Uh, in the case that sales taxes fall, uh, the hope is, is that it gets recycled for that again. Um, in addition, uh, on a going forward basis, we're projecting the 2012 level of sales taxes uh, with no growth. Same thing for the hotel taxes and positively Cleveland payments. So we're trying to be very conservative in our estimates. Um, the way the hotel revenues themselves are structured and how they work in the, in the bond plan is very similar to any number of these kinds of projects around the country. Uh, the net operating income from the hotel operator, Jeff mentioned that that would perhaps range from eight to $9 million a year. Uh, the TIF and the uh, hotel taxes together with the uh, uh, resources from the original convention center financing plan set forth in 2007. Uh, looking at a potential stabilized year from the hotel, now this brings into play more of an omnibus uh, pro forma that, uh, uh, that incorporates the sales tax and hotel tax, but also the revenue trade-offs back and forth from the convention center, the CCC, FDC uh, uh, entity, as well as the hotel funds both the debt service for the convention center uh, and global center, uh, and also for the hotel project the, uh, the goal, uh, particularly during the years that the quarter percent sales tax remains outstanding, is to generate revenue at the bottom line so there is revenue available every year for capital, for a capital repair fund for both the uh, convention center and the hotel. Um, uh, Councilman Miller asked uh, about the lease financing arrangements. I'll spend a few minutes on that and why the Port Authority's involved. Um, <clears throat> these particular financing arrangements are modeled after the Cleveland, Cleveland Brown Stadium uh, transaction for a couple of reasons. Uh, state law does limit uh, the ability of counties in the state to finance hotel projects. Does not really limit them as it relates to owning them but it limits their ability to finance them. As you may know, port authorities in Ohio have broad real estate powers. So uh, through a partnership and the Cleveland Brown Stadium through the city, financing is structured really in 
precisely the same way where the Port Authority owns the land, and in this case, to facilitate the TIF, uh, county uh, conveys property to the city, the property of the old administration building. City conveys property to the port that allows for uh, the facilitation of the TIF, and uh, the Port Authority, in essence, leases the project to the county. The county's lease payment to the port is the debt service on the bonds. Uh, specifically, these are not called bonds. The bond lawyers will yell at you if you call them bonds. They are certificates of participation. Uh, the bondholders, if you will, end up purchasing participating interests in the lease between uh, the county and the port, which also involves the bond trustee. Uh, bond trustee captures, sorry, captures all these revenues uh, and pays the debt service, provides monies that are available for capital repairs. Um, uh, the uh, uh, financing mechanism of certificates of participation differs a little bit from what you typically see uh, in Ohio local governments. Uh, interest rates are a little bit higher. Uh, these don't count against your statutory debt limitations, uh, um, uh, but they're very, uh, very popular among uh, local government bond investors. County is seeing the rating agencies next week, uh, and the county schedule currently calls for uh, these certificates to be issued sometime the week of April 21st. Uh, and as Jeff mentioned earlier, the more specific bond sources and uses of funds will be presented uh, at the April 15th meeting when we have some answers from uh, Hilton and Turner. I want to make one comment about that. Um, we have spent a lot of time developing sources and uses. I was asked the last time I was here the question about contingency. Uh, you know, Turner in the design build agreement will have a contingency. We have a contingency within a development budget. We have a contingency above the development budget. Uh, and that's all built into our plan, but we're not, we don't want to get into that until after we get the GMP after, after, after we're done fully negotiating with Hilton, and that'll be on the 15th when we'll give you that financial data. So that's why uh, at this point in time, uh, we're, we're gonna wait until the 15th to show you that piece of the puzzle. Madam President, can I ask a question yeah. at this point about the transfer of property? So I think I asked this last time and I just want clarification. So the county owned land is gonna be transferred, did I hear, to the city of Cleveland and then to the port? Correct. And I asked this before, I don't remember the answer about why the conduit, why don't we just transfer directly to um, the port? To, uh, so that the TIF works? There's a short answer. There's a number of different components to TIF law in Ohio. Uh, the part of the TIF law that we're using that allows TIF proceeds to be used in any and every part of the building uh, requires the title to run through the city of Cleveland at some point in the process. So, uh, uh, so that's what we're doing. Okay. Any other questions? I'd be happy to address them. What taxes are being tiffed? Uh, the non-school uh, ad valorem property tax. Okay. I, I think, that the, I think the, the answer is there's pilots for both school and non-school, but that portion that would be the school will ultimately be paid to the schools. So the only part using being used for finances is, is the non-school. There's no other questions. We have some time restraints here, and we also, because we have an executive session to handle very quickly. Um, if, um, this matter will be on for second reading, so everyone have certainly a number of opportunities to ask additional questions, and we can contact Mr. Applebaum or Mr. Offendorf um, individually. Madam President, I will. I'm just going to throw the question out, and I'll get the answer afterwards about the certification of whether this hotel has an equivalent to LEED certified and where we are uh, with that. I can, I can answer the question that it, it, it will be uh, LEED certified as part of the program. 
Uh, I, I believe right now that as part of the program, it's, uh, it's a, uh, we're looking at a silver certification. Yeah, we, so we have the three items. We have to vote on these individually. Greenspan, we don't let you ask any questions. I, I, I have my clip here to make it short. But the, the, so we won't know the, the GMP. We won't know the price of the project till the 15th. You're not voting for it anyway, so why are you asking the question? Well, because you can ask. <laughs> well, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> I, I guess I guess I'm that that transparent. Huh? Um, yeah, I'm just I'm just curious. Where where is that when we'll find out the total cost of the project? You, you will uh, you will know the total cost the total uh, cost of the project, uh, either be on the 15th or between the 15th and the 22nd. So this, before we have a final before reading. you have the final vote, you'll so, know. So okay. so we're, we're just so I'm clear. So we're moving legislation along. With, with, the, with the dollar blank. That's correct. OK. OK, um, I think we have to take these individually, uh, Ms. Schmetzer. Does it matter? I would recommend it. I mean, you're taking it out of committee and bringing it back. All right, so we can vote for all three to go out of committee. All right, uh, is, there a, is there a motion to take it out of committee and move it on for a second reading? Sure. I move, move, moved by Mr. Jaman and seconded by Ms. Conwell. All those in favor of moving these three items to the regular agenda for second reading indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Um, opposed, uh, Mr. Greenspan is no. So we have uh, 11, I mean 10 yeses. Um, all right, we have an executive session um, that will be fairly quick, so I'd like as many people to stop, to stay for this. All means of the Cuyahoga County Council are open to the public under the Ohio Open Means Law. Under that law, council may go into Madam President. Yes. Before you uh, proceed into executive session, yes. I had an item on miscellaneous business. Could I do that? Yeah, could you do it very quickly? Because we really have some time restraints, Mr. Miller. Uh, Madam President, at yesterday's Finance and Budget Committee, we had a discussion of the fact that the county recorded negative investment earnings in 2013. And after further clarification from the fiscal office, I want to make a few points. Number you, one. You sent this all out in emails, Mr. Miller, to everyone. OK. All right. Let, let's go ahead with the executive session. All members, all meetings of the Cuyahoga County Council Council are open to the public under the open meeting law. Under that law, council may go into executive session during a meeting for specifically authorized purposes. During executive session, council confers outside the hearing of the public. Council may not make any decisions about any matters in executive session. All decisions are made in public. This afternoon, council will go into executive session regarding discussions of pending litigation. Um, during this time, our live stream will be down, and we will ask all those specifically uh, not needed uh, in executive session to leave council chambers. Anyone may enter afterwards. Is there a motion to go into executive session? Move, moved by Mr. Jaman and seconded by Ms. Simon. Please call the roll. Moving to executive session, um, <clears throat> Ms. Simon? Yes. Mr. Greenspan? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. Mr. Germana? Yes. Mr. Gallagher? Yes. Mr. Schron? Yes. Ms. Conwell? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Harrison? Mr. Harrison stepped out for the moment. Uh, and Ms. Conley? Yes. All right, let the record reflect the time is 4.30.